I bind Lytias before Hermes the Restrainer and Persephone. The tongue of Lytias, the hands of Lytias, the soul of Lytias, the feet of Lytias, the body of Lytias, the head of Lytias. I bind Nikias before Hermes the Restrainer of the Areopagite, the hands, the feet, the tongue, the body of Nikias. I bind Demetrios before Hermes the Restrainer, the body, the business of Demetrios the Ceramic Worker, the hands, the feet, the soul. I bind Epicaranos before Hermes the Restrainer. I bind Demades, the ceramic worker, before Hermes the Restrainer, the body, the business, the soul. I bind Daphnis before Hermes the Restrainer. I bind Philonides before Hermes the Restrainer. I bind, I bind Simale Piste before Hermes the Restrainer. I bind Lytias, the feet, the hands, the soul, the body of Lytias, the tongue of Lytias, the will of Lytias, which is carried out before Hermes the Restrainer, and Persephone, and Hades. Welcome to Hearth of Hymonia. My name is Kate, and today we are talking about curse tablets. Curse tablets are one of the most common forms of magic in the ancient world, and they are used, as the name implies, to curse your enemies. Uh, not just general cursing, but cursing a specific aspect of their life. Curse tablets developed early on in Greece's history, as a way to put magic on other people. The earliest cursed tablets that we have don't have a lot of information on them. They consist usually of the victim's name and or symbols, maybe some drawings. And to me, this says that there's a much larger ritual happening in the background of cursed tablets that we don't have access to because spoken word doesn't survive. Unless it involves objects that are able to be preserved, ritual activity doesn't survive either. Early curse tablets only show us that people were practicing magic and that they were writing down the names of the people that they intended their magic to be directed against. Now, over time, as literacy develops and as an interest in literature develops, curse tablets become more complex. They have a lot more writing on them. They can sometimes have long lists of names or gods or whatever on there. Um, so they get more and more complicated as time goes on. I suspect that this also has to do with an increased interest in ceremonial magic. The earliest magic that we have would have been from regular everyday people who were just trying to make their lives better and were doing, for lack of a better word, practical magic. But as magic became fashionable among the elite educated classes who had been exposed to ceremonial religion um, and maybe were in positions of power within the church structure, curse tablets became more and more and more ceremonial in their nature. Ceremonial magic became the fashionable way to do magic, and so everything became more complicated, everything became more ritualistic, whereas before it was more down and dirty, practical, this is how you get things done. So what does a curse tablet look like? Typically, curse tablets are made from metal, at least the ones that survive. Now, I have a suspicion, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, that curse tablets were made out of all sorts of things that we don't have access to, like wooden tablets, I would guess linen, maybe tree bark, um, pretty much anything that you can write on. Now, a lot of these things don't survive in an archeological context, so what we have are primarily metal curse tablets. Of the metal curse tablets that we have, the vast majority of them are made from lead. There's two reasons why lead is the best material for a curse tablet. One is practical and one is symbolic. So the practical reason to use lead on a curse tablet is because it's a very soft metal, it's very easy to write on, and it's very easy to manipulate. A lot of curse tablets would have been rolled 
and lead was easier to roll than something that might be a little bit more sturdy. But lead also serves a symbolic purpose. Because lead is so soft and malleable, that made it impractical to use in a lot of applications where you needed a metal object to be strong. Tools and weapons, for example, lead is not a good choice to use because it breaks so easily. This lead to lead, this lead to lead being viewed as a useless metal in general. A lot of curse tablets that are written on lead begin with some kind of line that goes something like, just like this lead is cold and useless, so too may the victim of my spell be cold and useless. Curse tablets sometimes were rolled up and a lot of times were purposely damaged, so they're either pierced through with a nail or something like that. So we find a lot of nails in the same context as curse tablets. And usually when we unroll the curse tablets and read them, there's like big holes in the metal itself. I'm guessing this has something to do with sealing the spell. Um, you roll it up and then you say, all right, now it's over, it's done, there it is. So like I said, curse tablets have writing on them. In the early days, like I was talking about, they typically only had the names of the intended target. As things develop, some of the more complicated curse tablets have either an explanation of the situation, the name of the victim, and the name of the person who is performing the spell or commissioning the spell, however that's working. They also contain things called caracteres, characters, uh, which were magical symbols, a lot of which have been lost to us. The symbols would have been well known to magical practitioners, so if you are looking to put a curse on someone and you visit a professional curse tablet maker, um, they are able to write the symbols for you. So even though they may not mean a lot to us right now, in the ancient context, these would have been seen as effective. Sometimes curse tablets also had what we call wokes magikai, the magic voices or mystical words maybe. Uh, this is the incantation part. This is the abracadabra. Again, these syllables may not mean anything to us. They're not written in Latin or Greek or any known language, even though they use either the Latin alphabet, the Greek alphabet, or so on. They don't have any inherent meaning that we can understand today. Just like abracadabra, this would have been part of the ritual process to make the curse happen. And lastly, a lot of curse tablets contain the names of gods, daimones, supernatural figures that are being invoked to help the person enact this curse against their intended target. Typically for gods, you don't find curse tablets asking for help from Zeus or Poseidon or on the Roman side, you know, Minerva. They're typically underworld deities, your Hades, your Persephone, and then underworld aspects of gods who also have other unrelated functions. So one of the most popular is Hermes Trismegistus, who is an underworld aspect of the messenger god Hermes. Interestingly enough, as Greece and Rome grew in power and trade among all of the nations of the Mediterranean became more common, curse tablets start to include the names of gods from other religions, from other places. So Egyptian gods, maybe Mesopotamian gods, Persian gods, and what's really great, uh, we have a lot of curse tablets from like the second century in Egypt, and a lot of them contain invocations to the god of the Jews or the god of the Christians. Alternate names for Jesus Christ on these curse tablets, which I think is just so fun because it shows how interconnected belief systems were during these periods in these places. It was a very, very diverse time. And the mixing of cultures has always been a feature of magic, and it's cool to see that that is like part of it. Because as you know, there are a lot of, for example, modern pagans today who may include in their practice Loki, Demeter, maybe Freya, Anubis, 
all within the same practice, but then call themselves like a, a Celtic witch or something. So there's always cultural blending, there's always syncretism, both in modern witchcraft traditions and in ancient magic as well. So where do we find curse tablets? Curse tablets are found in a number of places. They, they aren't limited to any one particular archeological context, but there are some places where we find them more often than others. One of the big ones is wells. Curse tablets a lot of the time are found dropped into wells, sort of like how people throw coins into fountains. So what's the deal with wells? Why is this a good place for curse tablets? Well, again, we have a practical reason and we have a symbolic reason. So the practical reason to throw a curse tablet down the well is that no one's gonna find it. That's one reason. The other reason why wells are good for curse tablets is that they go underground. And if you are someone who lives in the ancient world, your conception of the underworld is that it is actually under the world for, for the most part. That's not universally true. Of course, nothing is universally true, but a lot of people believed that the underworld was actually under the world. So if you're trying to take an object like a curse tablet and deliver it to the underworld gods so that they can help you out, you want to put it in something like a well. Another place that a lot of curse tablets have been found are in cemeteries. So why cemeteries? I think the obvious reason is that if you're trying to get to the underworld, which is the world of the dead, sending a curse tablet with a dead person is a pretty good way to ensure that it gets to where it needs to go. There is also a practical aspect. If you are a good Roman or a good Greek, you do not want to go desecrating bodies because burial practices were seen as so important for getting somebody properly to the afterlife. You don't wanna go disturbing that process. If you found out that your great uncle was not in the underworld where he was supposed to be because somebody dug up his body, you're gonna be very upset. So most people are not going to go looking in these areas, so your curse tablet is gonna be safe. Now you can't just put a curse tablet with any old dead person. Uh, I guess you could but chances are if they've been buried properly, their soul has already gone to the underworld. So their body is just there. Now, not all corpses are created equal for the purposes of curse tablets. There are some types of bodies that are better than others. And all of the distinctions have to do with the way that the person died or the way that the person was buried. If a person wasn't buried properly, their soul can't rest in peace. So they might be wandering around and you can say, hey, when you get a free minute, can you take this curse tablet down to the underworld for me? Now, other types of bodies that might be good for curse tablets would be people who had died prematurely, um, who can't rest in peace because of the injustice of their death, people who maybe were executed, people who died violently. So if someone was murdered, their soul is not going to be able to rest in peace. So you might invoke them to help you deliver the curse tablet where it needs to go. Now, I just wanna say about the location of curse tablets and how they end up in these places. If you're someone who's familiar with modern spellcraft, typically, burying spell objects, spell items, or putting them in a stream or whatever have you, these are rituals for depositing something that you no longer need to use. So when the spell is over and completed, that's when you bury it, that's when you put it in the stream, that's when you put it in XYZ place. That is typical for modern witchcraft but it seems like the wells and the cemeteries and various other locations uh, where you find curse tablets, these seem to be like an activation point for the curse. So you make the curse tablet, you write everything you need to write on it, you roll it up, maybe you stick it with a nail, and presumably you do other aspects of ritual that again, we just don't have access to today. Chanting, I would imagine a lot of these would have singing, music of some kind, and then the spell is activated by putting it in this location. You send it to the underworld and you say, okay, now 
my part is done. Now I'm calling in the supernatural elements to help me with this. So I just wanted to point that out because I think it's a little bit different from our understanding of like burying the contents of a spell jar or something like that. Curse tablets are super common, and it begs the question, in what context are people cursing each other? If we find so many curse tablets, they must have been used for everything, right? And it turns out, yeah, basically they were used for everything. We can divide the curse tablets that have been excavated and deciphered and cataloged into four categories. You have business, you have law, you have love, and you have sports. So let's break this down really quick. I won't spend a lot of time talking about each one, but basically we have a lot of curse tablets from rival business owners. This makes sense. Now, if you are a spiritual person or if you're a superstitious person and you want to make your business better, Typically today you would do some kind of ritual that's like bringing abundance to you and bringing luck and success to you. But the way that it was done in the ancient world, especially in ancient Rome, because the Romans loved to like mess each other up, was to curse your rival. So we find a lot of curse tablets that say things like, you know, I, I curse so, so, or like I bind so-and-so to fail in their business. The implication being so that all of their clients come to me. We get a lot of curse tablets in legal contexts as well. The Romans just love to sue each other, but law is a high stakes game, right? So if you are being sued and either you're innocent or you don't wanna get caught, you know, you might have your life savings on the line. So you wanna, take every precaution and use every tool available to you to help you win your case. In all of my research, I've found that people typically do magic for things that they care a lot about. If you have a lot of money on the line and it really matters to you that you win this case or that your business is successful or you get the girl of your dreams, that's when you're gonna curse somebody. Now, I'm not gonna go into love magic basically at all because it's a whole topic. So the next video I put out is going to be just on love magic. But yeah, we have loads and loads and loads of curse tablets in romantic contexts. And then lastly, games. Now your uncle watches football, right? And he's like, he's really into it. He's got the jersey. He knows the blood type of the assistant coach. He remembers that one time in 1992 when they were on the 48 yard line, second down. That's all the football words I know. And your uncle gets really, really upset when his team loses, right? This is why there are curse tablets in athletics in the ancient world. Now the main forms of competition, and when I say athletics, I really should say competition, because there's also competition in theater as well. At Greek festivals, plays would be put in a competition with other plays. So you get some fun curse tablets that are like, I curse so-and-so so that they lose their voice and their tongue is tied and they don't remember the lyrics to their song and they get up on stage and they flop. Those are always fun. And then you get ones in contexts like wrestling and chariot races. The Romans were really, really, really into chariot races to the point where in the late, 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 late Roman Empire, the different chariot teams actually had like political sway. Um, I'm oversimplifying, but I just want to, I don't think you can overstate the importance of chariot races in Rome, honestly. Uh, so there's a lot of cursed tablets in that context as well. And these tend to be more violent than the theater ones, just because it's one thing to curse somebody to forget all their lines and make an idiot of themselves on stage. It's another thing to wish for the rival team to all, you know, get into a horrific chariot accident and break all their legs. So these are the main contexts. There are obviously others. Categorization can only go so far. Business, law, love, and we'll say competition are the main contexts. In order for somebody to want to take this route, to seek out a professional magician or to try and make a curse tablet at home, 
It implies one of two beliefs, not necessarily mutually exclusive, but they have to have at least one for them to seek out this kind of activity. Either they themselves have a deeply held belief that magic works, that magic is real, and you can use it to not only better your own life, but to harm your enemies. The fact that we have so many curse tablets says that people believed this, I would say more commonly than they do today. So they either have to believe that, or they have to believe that the victim of their curse believes that magic works, or that the circle that they run in, people believe that magic works. Why is that? I talked about wells and I talked about cemeteries, but these are not the only contexts that curse tablets are found in. A lot of them are found in places that maybe they were meant to be found. If you are suing someone and you find a curse tablet that says all of these horrible things, you know, may so-and-so's tongue fall out, that can be very scary. I mean, think about Germanicus, if you've seen my last video, and I'll put a link for it in the description, Germanicus believed, or he believed that he had been poisoned by Piso, but the implication is he believed that Piso had used magic against him. It was a big deal. It can be very scary if you believe that this is real, if you believe that someone has the power to curse you, and then you find evidence that you've been cursed, that can be terrifying. That can have a powerful psychological effect. The fact that most magic we find from the ancient world is what might be classified as dark magic or baneful magic speaks to a difference in your ideas about, I'm not sure how to phrase this, how, let's say, universal law works. In traditions that believe in reincarnation, so Buddhism, for example, certain schools of Buddhism preach that when you die, your soul gets reincarnated into another body. Whether that body is an improvement or a step backwards depends on your actions in this lifetime. The impulse for morality is this idea of karma, this idea of reincarnation. Almost everyone has some kind of moral compass guiding them. In the modern Western world, and again, I can speak primarily for the United States here, most of this is guided by a Christian worldview. Now, I'm not saying you have to be Christian to have this worldview. Most people in the Western world, even if they don't grow up in a religious household, even if they don't grow up in a Christian household, they grow up in a Christian culture because the majority religion in the United States and in many other countries in the Western world is Christianity. So the impulse to act in a particular way is guided, if not by a sincere belief in Jesus Christ, at least in a belief that the way of Christianity is the way to go. It leads to this sort of Christian structure that divinity is inherently good and humanity is inherently evil and we have to work very hard to be good. So there's all these things that we have to do to be good. And if you're a believing Christian, then of course the reward is after you die, you go to heaven. And the punishment, if you act incorrectly, is you go to hell. So you're probably not gonna be cursing people because God will be mad at you and then he will punish you. Basically every tradition has this kind of moral code to it. So Wicca, uh, Wiccans will be familiar with the threefold law, which is that anything that you put out into the universe will come back to you three times as strong. These types of moral codes are specific to the cultures and traditions that they grow up in. The Greeks and Romans did not have perfect gods. The Greeks and Romans did not believe necessarily that the universe was positive. The universe, in the eyes of the Greeks and Romans, could be basically anything. Because if you look at their gods, the gods go to war, commit sexual assault, and kill their children, and spite humans for no reason. They have trickster gods. They have all of these different elements working in the divine structure to say that, that divinity is not inherently good. 
And furthermore, the way that the Greeks and Romans saw the afterlife was different from, say, Christianity's conception of heaven and hell. The Greeks and Romans believed that when you die, you will go to the underworld. The underworld has different places and some of them are good, like the Elysian Fields. These were typically places reserved for heroes, particularly heroes in battle. Most everybody just ended up in like the regular people area and then some people were punished. But it wasn't one or the other. It wasn't eternal salvation or eternal damnation. Most people could expect to just go to the regular people area. It sort of didn't matter what you did as long as you got buried properly. That gives you a lot more freedom to curse people without fear of going to hell forever. One of the implications of curse tablets is that people saw universal law differently and they acted accordingly. Now, I want to end by giving you my thoughts about the mechanism of curse tablets. So the mechanism for cursing somebody implies a series of assumptions and conditions. A lot of curse tablets use the principle of sympathetic magic, which is like with like. When I say sympathetic magic, I don't mean magic where you feel bad for somebody or magic where you're like, oh, I totally sympathize with you. It's not like that. Sympathetic magic, very specifically, is that like attracts like. In a modern context, if you wanted to do a spell for abundance, you might use a green candle because, at least in America, our paper money is still green. Green candle, green money, like with like. So if the candle is green, it's going to attract the green of the money to it. This is why you get a lot of curse tablets that say, just like this lead is cold and useless, so too may... Marcus be cold and useless. So the curse tablet basically creates a parallel situation for the sympathetic magic to work. Now, not all curse tablets use the principle of sympathetic magic, but a lot of them do. One of the most crucial assumptions of a curse tablet is that words have inherent power. If words didn't have inherent power, you wouldn't bother writing them down. Now, in the ancient world, this was a fairly commonly held belief. Um, the Etruscans thought this, the Greeks thought this, the Romans thought this. Words have inherent power. And that's an assumption for all verbal spell work as it is all incantation, but this was a given in the ancient world. And so curse tablets provided a way to harness the power of words into action through magic. Another assumption is that there is an underworld, which I guess is not that's surprising for the ancient world, but it's still an assumption nonetheless. And not only is there an underworld, either somewhere on this plane or on a parallel plane maybe that overlaps with ours somehow, um, there are actually several places that were supposed to be entrances to the underworld. The crucial point here is that this underworld can be accessed by the living. Either directly, so we have mythological stories of living people going down to the underworld, but these people are typically not your everyday humans. They have extraordinary powers or extraordinary destiny. For regular people though, you could access the underworld indirectly by speaking to the underworld deities through these cursed tablets. So that's another assumption. And the last assumption is that not only can we communicate with these underworld deities, but they are willing to hear us out and they're willing to do our bidding if we do the ritual correctly. Either willingly, maybe we gave them offerings or something, or through compulsion. Now the compulsion theory is falling out of practice, but I don't think we can scrap it completely because I think there were people who believed that the supernatural entities in the underworld could be compelled to do your bidding through various spells and threats and things like that. We do have evidence of that. But when I say the compulsion theory is falling out of fashion, what I mean is that people used to think that that was the only way that magic worked. You know, 19th century scholars thought that good godly people prayed and bad ungodly people tried to force God to do things. But they can also be persuaded, right? You can make an offering or you can make a deal or you can say that you have been a loyal 
subject for a long time and you really need a favor. There's a lot of different ways that you can get the underworld gods to do what you want them to do. But the assumption is that they're willing to do it one way or the other. Um, and that gives humans a tremendous amount of power. Maybe they're not more powerful than the gods. Maybe they're not more powerful than demigods or daimones or whatever other entities are out there or down there. But it's a way for humans to feel like they are not useless. Um, so the assumption is that if you do these things, you have the sort of power to shape your own reality here. So that's all I have for you about cursed tablets today. Again, I'm going to come back to love magic in general and specifically cursed tablets in a love context, in a romantic context or a sexual context in the next video. But for now, I will leave it here, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you like this video, you can let me know by giving it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more content about magic and religion in the ancient world, you can go ahead and subscribe. I'm going to be posting a lot more videos like this as we go. So thanks again for watching, and I will see you next time.